Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. And of course, good morning if you're joining us from the West Coast. Um, and welcome to everyone who's uh, online with us today for this webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Tom Alves. I'm the Head of Development at Ahuri, and it's my pleasure to be the host for this um, much anticipated and very well subscribed uh, webinar that we have today. First of all, I'd like to begin, I guess, by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge on your behalf um, that um, all or most of us coming today are on Aboriginal land and uh, want to pay on your behalf my respects to Elders past and present from the various lands uh, from which you are joining us and also, I guess, to celebrate and acknowledge um, the Aboriginal culture and connection ongoing to country and waterways across Australia. Also, I'd like to welcome um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us for this webinar today. Before we get stuck into the webinar proper and I introduce our presenters, I just have a, a few um, and uh, uh, other announcements that I, I need to get through first. Um, initially, um, I need to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and so um, we'll appreciate your input uh, today, but if you need to come back and you wanna come back and look at the webinar again, you'll be able to do that uh, through the Ahuri website. And for those who've missed out on being able to attend today, um, you can let them know that they are able to access the webinar uh, in the future uh, from our website as well. Um, you will also be sent, those of you participating today, a survey uh, based on today's webinar that would love you to fill out and should only take a, a few moments, but we'd really appreciate that time at the end uh, just to uh, record your feedback. Um, it's very helpful for us. We would appreciate that. Um, a few pointers on participating in the webinar today now. Uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see there should be a, a panel which has um, some tabs for, for chat and for Q&A and for handouts. And I'd just like to explain how that works. Um, so the Q&A is um, one that I'd really um, encourage you to engage with um, as you listen to the presentation and, uh, and the discussion that follows. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on that. And, um, and through the discussion um, following the presentation, we will... Uh, pick up on some questions that people have put forward and also some of the themes that are emerging through the questions. Um, we may not have a chance to ask every question and apologise in advance if I don't get to yours, but uh, uh, but please do uh, provide your questions there because that will really um, make sure that we can focus our conversation on the themes and, and the questions that are of interest to you. Uh, please submit your question at any time uh, during the presentation and webinar. Um, there's also the uh, chat function, which uh, I believe is enabled uh, during the webinar today. Um, that is an opportunity for you to um, uh, communicate with one another as you listen to the presentation. And maybe to kick off, um, break the ice on that, uh, you might want to uh, share what particular country uh, you're coming from uh, today as a way of uh, making yourself known on the chat. And uh, you can use that function throughout the webinar. Um, and now before we get into today's webinar, I also want to announce that we'll be holding a one day uh, conference uh, in person in Adelaide on Monday, the 28th of November, um, at Renting in Australia, the Challenges and Reforms. Uh, registration for this one day conference is now open and you can see uh, the details on your screen there, uh, how to uh, go and uh, register for that event. If you are in Adelaide or want to be in Adelaide on the 28th of November, that's open now. All right, let's uh, focus on the topic in hand today, which is encouraging private sector development of social and affordable housing. Our presenter today is Richard Benedict from the University of Sydney. Uh, Richard is the lead author of Ahuri's report of the same name, Private Sector Development in, of Social and Affordable Housing. Uh, which examines uh, models of engaging private sector investors and developers in financing and delivering social and affordable housing across a range of market segments and also different tenures in Australia and internationally. 
Uh, it also identifies um, the existing and uh, potential players in this space and talks to the financial, regulatory and other barriers that might exist to wider participation. Uh, this report, along with a policy evidence summary based on the report and a standalone executive summary, uh, are now available on the AHURI website, as indeed are all of our reports. Um, but right now you can also access this report through the handout section at the right-hand side of the screen. So if you want to um, have a closer look while the uh, presentation is taking place, uh, you can access the report um, convenient there. So to introduce our presenters, Richard Benedict is a research associate at Sydney University. Uh, he is also the director of Richard Benedict Consulting and advises government, not-for-profit and private sector agencies um, across a range of projects to create positive social impact. Richard has more than 30 years experience working in the private sector and in government and in not-for-profit housing sectors in Australia, as well as in the United States of America. So welcome, Richard. I'd also like to welcome Amy Maynard and Peter Johnson, who you can see on the screen as well, and they will offer a response um, to uh, the presentation uh, once Richard is finished. Amy is the General Manager of uh, Safe uh, Strategy and Communications at BHC, where she is responsible for development of new service delivery models and strategic projects. Uh, she has over 15 years experience in the housing sector and is part of the BHC leadership team where she plays a pivotal role shaping and delivering BHC's strategies for growth and innovation in affordable housing. And now Peter, Peter is the Managing Director of Lighthouse Infrastructure and he is responsible for the investment process and management of the business. Uh, Peter also has responsibility for portfolio management and growth initiatives for Lighthouse and he is a member of Lighthouse's Investment Committee. Okay, the format for today's webinar, as I've already indicated, is that I'll hand over shortly to Richard uh, to deliver a presentation based on his report, at the conclusion of which I'll then invite uh, first Amy and then Peter uh, to come onto the virtual stage and uh, give a, a response uh, to the presentation and the report. And then after that, um, we'll, um, I guess, open the floor for questions uh, through the Q&A and, uh, and I'll manage a discussion uh, between our three presenters uh, as we look to uh, address some of the issues that you're raising. So it's now my great pleasure to um, introduce our presenter, Richard Benedict, and invite him uh, to take us through his uh, findings. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Ahuri, for making this research possible and for giving us the opportunity to share the results with this audience today. As you summarized at the beginning, the research project had four aims. The first of those was to look internationally at established and emerging models for engaging private sector investors and developers in financing and delivering social and affordable housing. The second was to look specifically here in Australia at the appetite for new and deeper private sector participation in Australia's affordable housing industry, particularly in light of COVID-19, when this research was being undertaken the pandemic had just begun. We then looked at identifying who the key players were and what some of the financial regulatory or development barriers to wider participation might be. And those informed defining some strategies for maximizing private sector participation in social and affordable housing supply, while also building industry capacity and fostering emerging markets. In this study, we use the term private sector to refer to all non-government non-public entities, and that includes both for-profit and not-for-profit housing providers. For-profit housing providers were um, included both listed and non-listed companies of all sizes who may develop or provide financing for developing housing. Not-for-profit private housing providers also develop or finance housing, but with a corporate charter that prevents them from taking distributions as profit, so any surplus from operations is directed back into housing. And the community housing sector comprises the vast majority of private non-profit, not-for-profit housing entity, entities currently managing um, almost 120,000 homes, valued at about um, $18 billion in assets. The research team involved researchers from the University of Sydney and Curtin University with industry specialists. And we applied a um, series of methods to undertake this research. 
Initially, we undertook an international evidence review of the body of practice and research, and that informed a typology of housing products across market segments, government subsidies and policies, and potential private sector involvement relevant to Australia. This typology provided a reference point for the next stages of research. We undertook investigative panels and interviews with 45 leaders of private finance, private developers, community housing, and policy groups. From the finance sector, it included superannuation funds, institutional investors, impact investment funds, and uh, the big banks. From the development sector, uh, in the private for-profit developers, it included tier one and tier two developers, as well as small to medium enterprise builders and Aboriginal owned companies that are involved in building social housing. Specialist housing providers uh, included um, community housing organizations and other not-for-profit organizations that were experienced in working with uh, private partners um, to deliver Aboriginal and specialist housing. Um, and most of the participants who were involved in these panels and interviews were CEOs, managing directors, and senior executives. And they reported a very high level of interest from their organizations in the research. And we took that as an initial strong sign in terms of the strong appetite by the sector. Our fourth group of uh, participants were policy leads across all of the state um, government um, departments, um, including the Australian government. We developed a series of case studies of exemplar projects that examined the range of approaches for fostering private participation across market segments and Australian jurisdictions. And on all of that research combined into developing a strategic roadmap for government to optimize resources towards scaling up private sector involvement in social and affordable housing, including key challenges, risks, and mitigation strategies. I wanted to briefly summarize the key findings from the research as a bit of a teaser, but also to provide a structure for the presentation. And then I will dig into the actual evidence that substantiates each one of these findings um, uh, through the presentation. From the International Evidence Review, we found that hybridity of housing systems is essential to meet demand, and in, in particular in Australia is increasingly becoming a way of delivering social and affordable housing. We heard from the private finance and development sector that they had a very strong appetite for investing in affordable and social housing projects. The in evidence in Australia and internationally demonstrates proven successful models that can be replicated to scale up private sector participation in social and affordable housing supply. Maximizing opportunities for private sector participation, we heard requires some form of gap subsidy from government, particularly for those in highest need and on lowest incomes, along with strong policy settings, effective regulation and efficient procurement processes. There are risks in partnerships for, for government, for private uh, partners and for community housing partners, um, as well as residents, and these require careful mitigation. And a national housing strategy is needed, set by Australian government and implemented through all levels of government with commitments to address long-term demand. The International Evidence Review, and looking particularly in Australia, demonstrated that hybridity of the housing system is important and increasingly a combination of government not-for-profit and for-profit organizations are involved in financing developing and managing specialist social social specialist social and affordable housing this reflects from the literature increasing hybridity across the housing system and also longer term social and economic policy reforms linked to neoliberalism in industry some for-profit firms and social enterprises have sought to produce or deliver social and affordable housing, while investors are increasingly valuing environmental, social, and governance goals, and evidence of demonstrable corporate social responsibility from business. The well-documented need in Australia for 36,000 new social and affordable homes per year to meet the forecast demand to 2036 is such that this hybridity of the housing system and cross-sector partnerships are gonna be very important no one sector can address the need alone. The research team reviewed all current funding policies and initiatives across Australian governments in the wake of um, COVID-19. And we found that a range of initiatives are being undertaken to many of which involve the private sector in delivering new social and affordable housing. 
In the last three years, Australian governments have committed significant new funding and uh, and, uh, other policy initiatives to deliver deliver around 105,000 additional social and affordable homes. Breaking that down, states and territories committed about $11.3 billion in capital to build 34,000 new social and affordable homes in the next five years. And more recently, the Albanese government has committed $10 billion in the Australia um, Housing Australia Future Fund to finance an additional 30,000 homes. This dwarfs the spending following the global financial crisis, where the Australian government allocated $5.6 billion to the social housing initiative, delivering 20,000 new homes. In addition to that, there are a range of other initiatives that in leverage private sector participation in delivery. The National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation bond aggregator, which was established in 2019, is raising private low-cost debt finance for community housing providers. State governments are undertaking a variety of partnerships, public-private partnerships and joint venture projects uh, to develop um, new social housing, often renewing public housing estates. Independent from government, community and Aboriginal housing organizations are working with private partners to deliver mixed income projects where the social and affordable housing can be cross-subsidized by private housing. But accumulating all these initiatives and despite their good intentions, they, uh, they will fall well short of the documented shortage of affordable housing that is um, needed and that will persist without enduring government equity and co-investment programs. From our panelists and our interview participants, we heard overwhelmingly from the private sector that there is very strong appetite to invest in affordable housing partnerships, despite the fact that it delivers, in some cases, lower yields compared to private residential investment. We heard from interviews interviewers that there's, quote unquote, there's more money than there are places to invest, um, and that the appetite has never been stronger, which was very encouraging. Lower yields for uh, from affordable housing were seen to be offset by lower risk, which participants advised holds value for longer than market rental. This strong private sector appetite reflects an increasing focus we heard by boards and shareholders for projects that deliver environmental and social outcomes, as well as reasonable returns. And in some cases, participants re- reported that investors will accept a lower rate of return on projects that clearly demonstrate that clear social benefit. And we heard that from institutional investors as well as from the um, banks. Developer participants advise that they are working on with not-for-profits on initiatives that deliver social outcomes even within their own projects in doing things like providing transitional housing for um, families escaping domestic and family violence. And that's to meet their own internal uh, ESG goals. Overall, the research showed that a range of established and emerging affordable housing product types across market segments can be supported through collaboration with the private for-profit and not-for-profit sector. But these depend on different combinations of government subsidies, policy settings, and regulations. um, And they are suitable for delivery across a variety of different development contexts, contexts. I'll explore each one of these housing types a little bit further and summarize what we heard from the participants, as well as providing some exemplar case studies. Developers and policy leaders in general see redevelopment of public housing estates through public-private partnerships as opportunities to increase social and affordable housing supply while also achieving better social outcomes. Participants who were involved in these projects reported that they involve can involve long, complex government procurement and planning approval processes, which does add costs and risk to the scheme. Participants from development sector as well as the policy sector advise that, uh, and the community housing sector advise that risks in these projects should be allocated to the party best positioned to manage them effectively and efficiently, and that effective partnerships depend on clear roles and responsibilities with all parties taking accountability for outcomes assigned to them. The Ivanhoe project in New South Wales is being developed by Fraser's Property Australia and community housing organisation Mission Australia Housing to redevelop the current, uh, the previous Ivanhoe estate, which had 256 social housing units, to provide 950 new social and 130 new affordable rental homes 
along with 2,000 market homes for sale. Construction commenced in 2021 is expected to be completed in 2031. In addition to the housing, um, there are a range of other facilities, educational facilities, employment, um, and, and um, community centers. And we heard from the interview participants that they see these large urban renewal projects as providing the opportunity not just to provide innovative design, but also to deliver better social outcomes, working in partnership with community housing providers who are managing uh, the social and affordable housing. We did hear that tendering, planning, and delivery risks added time and cost to these projects, and they did experience some prejudice against social housing um, in initially as a challenge, but encouragingly, the market sales of the private housing has been very strong, indicating that there is market appetite for mixed, these type of mixed tenure projects. Mixed tenure was seen as a really attractive model by um, the private sector for and by the not-for-profit, uh, private not-for-profit sector for cross-subsidizing social and affordable housing from uh, private housing and achieving an acceptable level of return and risk through that, that blend. Some community housing participants reported that they have begun to use mixed tenure projects to end it them themselves. Um, sometimes in partnership with the private sector to cross subsidize high need housing and uh, to achieve community outcomes. However, it was acknowledged that cross subsidization transfers risk to CHOs who may not be adequately capital cap capitalized or compensated to take that market risk of selling or renting market homes. The Aboriginal housing company is developing a site in Redfern known as previously the block in partnership with Day Group private developer and SCAPE, uh, a private student accommodation provider to deliver a mixed tenure mixed use projects, which will, which has, it's completed now, delivered 62 units of affordable rental housing for uh, Aboriginal people uh, with a separate building that's 596 of student beds of student accommodation of which 110 units are retained for Aboriginal students. In addition to that, there are commercial and retail spaces, an office space for the Aboriginal housing company, child care center, art gallery, and boxing gym. The financing model for this was in very innovative. Uh, SCAPE provided an upfront 99 year lease payment to the Aboriginal housing company for the student accommodation portion. And that capital enabled the affordable Aboriginal housing company to build the Aboriginal housing unencumbered by any additional debt. The um, Aboriginal housing company also receives revenue from the commercial and the retail spaces to crops subsidize their operating costs. And we heard from the interviewees from the Aboriginal housing company that this will enable Aboriginal people to live on that site and use that site forever and a day. <clears throat> Participants advise that tax subsidies, such as the National Rental Affordability Scheme Initiative, can successfully leverage private investment in new affordable housing supply, but they express concern over the relatively short 10-year affordability requirement from INRES and the potential loss of that affordable housing when the requirement for affordability lapses and those that stock may revert back into the private market. Participants also advise that longer-term affordability is likely to require a longer-term subsidy and this was also seen as enabling the community housing sector to leverage finance, to be able to put together deals, borrow senior debt, and um, provide a pipeline of projects. There's growing interest in the potential for build to rent developments by the private sector, but participants generally agreed that build to rent projects cannot provide affordable housing without additional subsidy. And um, in fact, in some cases, they are being rented at a premium to um, long-term affordable rental housing. So they're not a, a panacea in and of themselves in delivering affordability. Some land tax concessions are coming into play in some jurisdictions, but they were viewed as not being sufficient to subsidize affordable housing by themselves. The build to rent to buy model, which is targeted at middle income households, has been more successful, um, albeit there's been only on a limited number of projects to date. Aware Super is investing in key worker affordable rental housing, which they say attra provides attractive returns for their members while also making a difference in the communities where their members live, work, and retire. 
They have um, developed or are in the process of building on 15 sites in Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, and Perth, um, which will provide a total of 1,650 affordable rental units that will be rented at 80% of the market rate to essential key workers. These projects involved a mixed tenure um, component where private rental and purchase cross subsidizes the affordable rental housing within mixed tenure projects. And we heard from Aware Super that their affordable rental portfolio has actually outperformed their private rental portfolio, particularly over the COVID years because of the very, very high levels of demand for this housing, um, which meant that there were high levels of lease up, very low levels of vacancy. Um, and um, that has meant that overall it has outperformed their, their private portfolio, residential portfolio. Inclusionary zoning by international comparison as a planning mechanism to, to um, in, get the private sector to contribute um, affordable housing has been limited in Australia, both in prevalence and scale. But very, I suppose, encouragingly, overall, the developers that we spoke with broadly recognized the need for mandatory inclusionary zoning. Uh, we heard many of them say that um, it just has to happen. And uh, it needs to happen on a consistent basis with certainty, which allows them to factor that into the price of the land and to assess project feasibility in a similar way that other developer contributions um, for um, things like um, community services are factored in. But we did hear that developer and policy participants advise phasing that mandatory inclusionary zoning in over several years to not financially disadvantage projects that are on sites that are already owned and that uh, ideally it should be done in conjunction with incentives such as density bonuses. We heard from policy representatives in South Australia and WA that um, low deposit home loans and shared equity schemes are assisting even uh, low income households into home ownership. Um, and um, in some cases, very low uh, um, house, house, household incomes by providing a subsidy that helps the um, household save for the deposit. In terms of uh, home build um, and home ownership grants that were offered under COVID as part of the economic stimulus, we heard from policy uh, participants that the strong take up of those grants was seen to have contributed to inflationary pressures in the market and exacerbated labor market and supply chain constraints. And they um, said that there was a lesson learned in terms of overstimulation. Panelists noted that home ownership initiatives appear to capture policy enthusiasm, particularly at the moment, um, despite, despite the large and growing proportion of Australian households who rent and need an affordable rental product. Institutional Investment Fund Investec developed uh, with private builder Hindmarsh, a mixed tenure project in Bowden, South Australia. They purchased government land, which had a mandatory inclusionary zoning of 15% requirement. They negotiated with um, the South Australia government to actually provide 37% uh, of the units as affordable build to rent to buy, along with 54 units that were sold to the market. And we heard that they saw this mix um, product as being a very effective way of mitigating risks and uh, potentially attractive to significant capital that was out in the market. Rent for the affordable households was discounted for three years to allow them to save for a deposit and the purchase price, the affordable purchase price was set no greater than 30% of the household income. The government helped further de-risk the project by uh, providing a buy option for affordable housing if individuals didn't purchase, but they did not have to exercise that on any projects as all of the affordable houses households proceeded to purchase their home within the three years and uh, many of them purchased within the first year. The actual tenancy allocation and management of that affordable housing while it was being rented was done by community housing organization, CHL. We heard from private participants that the community housing sector is seen as an essential partner. They stated that regulated community housing organizations that are managing affordable housing keep vacancy rates and rental arrears low, which reduces risk and improves the financial returns, sustains the financial returns, and they maintain properties so that they retain their value better. Participants did emphasize that building capacity in the community housing sector is key to attracting further institutional investment and scaling up new supply, 
and that that requires ongoing government subsidy. Developers also identified the tax concessions that community housing organizations are entitled to as charitable organizations as helping to reduce development costs and improve affordability and an attractive reason to be partnering with community housing organizations to, to deliver mixed income projects. We heard that the private sector participation uh, uh, in social and affordable housing partnerships helps to build industry capacity and also achieves wider outcomes. Uh, participants had reported that um, they saw community housing organizations as building skills, capacity and experience in complex transactions by working in partnership with the private sector. Institutional investment, such as through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, was seen to drive innovation in, in design and higher environmental standards, which translates into reduced operating costs for tenants. We heard that developers are building, uh, running training programs to build skills and capacity within local communities, and in some cases, remote communities, um, which th through programs that offer training and employment, but that that requires the right contract timeframes and resources. And panelists advise that government set outcome targets for these wider benefits with flexibility to design innovative solutions that can best meet these outcomes and report on progress. Participants widely agreed that government gap subsidy is essential, particularly for households in highest needs. The international evidence shows that private involvement in social and affordable housing should be seen as extending rather than replacing public subsidy. And participants emphasize that housing for low income earners will always require some form of gap subsidy to fund the difference between what they can afford to rent and what it costs the private sector to deliver it. We heard time and again the phrase, there is no silver bullet. A partial alternative to direct subsidies to reduce costs for such as by government providing land or using inclusionary planning mechanisms. And we heard from institutional investors that if government funded social housing in the same way as other infrastructures, such as hospitals and roads, by setting targets and providing long term subsidies, it would unlock significant institutional investment towards scaling up new supply. Industry identified a, a, a number of barriers and risks that uh, need to be addressed to increase participation in social and affordable housing. Uh, they reported that changes in governments and changed and discontinued policies and programs, which and the lack of continuity across political and bureaucratic leadership undermines opportunities to expand private sector participation in social and affordable housing. What is needed is certainty to build investor confidence across all regulatory and program settings. From the development sector, we heard of additional challenges that are particularly exacerbated in the wake of bushfires and COVID-19 um, that related to the lack of access to suitable sites, labor and material shortages, and uh, long and complex government tending and planning approval processes. There are also risks to government, community housing and specialist housing organizations and residents from increased private participation. And this includes the leaking of public assets and subsidies to the private sector away from target tenants, inefficient and poor delivery of projects, potential disruption to tenants, particularly through public housing renewal projects and the, and the diversion of resources and opportunities from the community housing sector. Government also reported that there are risks in terms of uh, reputational risks, operational risks, and financial risks to government from increased private sector participation. And overall, these risks need carefully designed programs, strong due diligence, and effective regulation and oversight by government to be uh, mitigated. In conclusion, Australian and international evidence that uh, demonstrates a range of proven successful models that can be replicated to scale up private sector participation in social and affordable housing supply through cross-sector partnerships. What is needed is a national housing strategy to address demand across market segments from crisis to specialist social affordable rental and affordable purchase housing and then commitments from every level of government for targets to address each type of that housing with proportionate funding and policy commitments to leverage private sector involvement in delivering on those targets. Those funds need to be administered through clear, consistent and efficient procurement processes to competitively allocate resources to private 
uh, for-profit and not-for-profit sectors working ideally in partnership. And going forward after they've been built, regulatory systems are important, ideally on a national basis for consistency, to measure, monitor, and control achievement of those targets and quality of housing for the households. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Really appreciate that um, clear presentation of your research. And of course, I um, commend the report to everyone uh, on the webinar today, and you can go and have a closer look at that. Um, I will answer one question very quickly up front, which um, was around, uh, I guess, what is in scope here. And it is really, we are looking at the full range of um, my term affordable housing all the way through from uh, from social uh, housing and inclusive of uh, public and community housing uh, through to I guess affordable market products so that all of that is in scope and and, uh, and Richard's report does look at the range of private sector um, opportunities and involved to bring housing across that that spectrum um with that clarification, I'm now going to turn to uh, Amy and invite you to uh, give your thoughts and responses uh, to um, this presentation and the report. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Tom, and thanks, Richard. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that I'm coming to you all today from Yugara and Turrbal country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, and a big congratulations, Richard, to you and the team for the report. There were so many like yes and ticks as we were going through and reading it, I think. You've managed to capture a lot of these really important insights really well and obviously very, very topical and timely for this report to be released. So congratulations. Um, for those who aren't familiar with BHC, we are one of Queensland's largest community housing providers. We are a developer and a manager of about 2,000 units of affordable and social accommodation across Brisbane. We were set up um, by Queensland State Government and Brisbane City Council as a growth provider. So really what's in our DNA is about how we bring more supply uh, to people across Brisbane predominantly who need it. A large proportion of our um, growth since then has been based on capital grants, but as noted in the report, the demand is increasing to, uh, beyond the point that capital grants and traditional funding mechanisms are going to be able to match alone. So uh, at BHC, we are seeing, I'm sure, like many other community housing providers, increased demand, people contacting us every day who never thought that they would be in need of having housing services or at risk of homelessness, but they are. And so we have been working for many years, along with lots of other CHPs in the sector, to look at models of institutional investment to work with the private sector and also to, go, to work with government to understand how we might be able to collaborate to unlock this type of investment. Um, as mentioned by Richard, there isn't a silver bullet. Uh, there is no silver bullet, but we know that we absolutely need as many strings in the bow as possible. So we're really thrilled at BHC that we have been able to uh, work through the Queensland State Government's Housing Investment Fund recently and partner with QIC and secure the support of Australian Retirement Trust uh, with the intent to deliver up to 1,200 new social and affordable housing dwellings and a little bit of market product as well across southeast Queensland over the next few years. Uh, we're starting with seven projects and 600 dwellings, and some of those are already underway, which is really exciting. So what does all this mean for BHC, for the sector, and how do we do more of this collectively? Well, it comes down to three key things, and Richard and the team have identified these just beautifully in the report. But for us, a major, major factor of success here is going to be that system reform. The way that the system is structured has to change and it needs absolutely all levels of government working in the same direction. We need that better data. We 100% need that national housing strategy. And we need funding and policy and frameworks across all those levels of government that really demand supply increases. And hopefully we see some of that emerging in the budget this evening, so the sounds are good there. The second element is risk, um, and we know that risk allocation and risk management are absolutely core to getting these kind of agreements over the line and reaching a value for money solution. That funding and policy risk, Richard, that you mentioned is absolutely critical at both the Commonwealth and state levels to make sure we've got that certainty built into the structure of the system and we can move away from the pendulum swing or the uncertainty that the election or political cycles might bring in terms of what might be on the table for housing. That long-term ability to commit and go forward and create from that basis is so important. 
The other risks in terms of the costs and times of procurement are, of course, a big factor for all of the private sector parties, that CHPs and the other private sector partners alike. And, of course, at the moment, the costs of finance and the increasing cost of construction are a huge risk. So that risk allocation, that risk management, making sure that the parties who are best placed to manage the risk, who understand the risk best, take on that risk. We absolutely agree with that from the report. And the third one is really about capacity. Um, community housing providers are absolutely essential as partners in the delivery of these and in lots of other aspects of these deals as well. So building the capacity of the sector uh, to be able to participate, to partner really strongly and to hold our own in these commercial negotiations is absolutely essential. We also need to make sure that the processes for participation are as simple as possible so that the CHP resources can be directed towards supply instead of big costs that might go on for a long time. So it's not only the capacity though of the CHPs that needs boosting through these deals. We are all learning together as these initial sort of projects uh, get launched. The private sector partners are learning about how the CHP world works and the government agencies who are administering them are also learning about how to structure commercial deals for, for housing. And it is different. This is people's homes that we're talking about. So we necessarily have to have a different approach to that structuring and the commercial aspects than we would possibly for roads and tunnels and that sort of thing. And so different approaches are needed and they've got to be flexible and they've got to foster, uh, you know, the right amounts of innovation and be able to bring the parties together to really learn and produce a solution that's effective for all partners. So I'll stop there, but basically, you know, we all know that this housing crisis did not happen overnight. The supply of social housing hasn't kept up with the pace of population demand or that growth yeah. in need. And we know that what is a basic necessity of life for some people is a commodity for others. And so that's a very challenging system to work within. We heard here in Queensland at the Housing Summit just last week that we know that the solutions aren't going to be overnight either. But what we do know is that the private sector is going to be an absolutely essential part of that solution in its many forms. And there's definitely enough work for everybody to play a role here. So congratulations, Richard and the team, for your excellent report. Um, and for giving us such a clear and timely roadmap for making all of this happen. It's a really important report. Congratulations. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Peter, I'm going to invite you now to um, give your thoughts on this. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and uh, I join you today from Wurundjeri country too, and I'd like to pay my respects to um, Elders past, present and emerging uh, for those of you not familiar with um, Lighthouse Infrastructure, we are a boutique investment manager who focuses on um, investment outcomes for institutional investors that have a people or planet related um, uh, theme to them. Um, we choose uh, what we invest in. Um, to date, we have chosen to invest in renewable power, disability accommodation, and also key worker accommodation, partnering with the community housing sector. Um, I'd like to offer my thanks also to Richard and his team, uh, not just for the paper that they have delivered today, but for the work that they've done continuously over uh, many, many years. I think the consistency of the research is our corporate memory. As we cycle through different political cycles, it's important actually to remember, to study and inform those who will come into power in the future. So congratulations to you. I'm sure this work and future work will have a very key role in development of policy. And thanks for the opportunity to respond today. Um, I come from essentially the finance world. We deliver money. We don't build homes. So uh, my comments may, feel, may appear a little shallow, but trying to give them context um, to uh, how the institutional world uh, looks at this opportunity and what challenges it might face. And the paper, I think, tried to address, you know, two key elements. What's the appetite and what can we learn? And it made me think of, okay, if we are successful and we've decided we did want private sector capital involved and we looked into the future, what will have occurred before that that's actually delivered that outcome? I think to use the work of Chris Leptos in the NIFIC review, uh, which amongst other things actually did a great job of at least quantifying the challenge that faces us as a community looking into the future. And it is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So if we have the private sector coming to the market with hundreds of billions of dollars, what will have occurred and what are those key ingredients, the most vital elements that came from your work, but to pluck a few out. First is that I particularly liked was, you know, 
the first table, actually, which was just simply a taxonomy. Uh, you called it typology, but I think a clear understanding of the language that we use and the implied risk allocation that exists within those different structures. These things are vital if we are going to develop a capital market where there is activity and people understand what they're doing. As you also pointed out, and Amy has also repeated this, the risk allocation and a clear model and repeatability. Um, we were talking before the webinar started about the success of a consistent system that the US has delivered in terms of tax credits. Um, you also mentioned in your report NRAS. Um, now, NRAS was an attempt to sort of, I think, tackle the same sort of problem. And then it had its fallings and its failings. Now, we should probably try and learn from those. But what will have occurred in the future, if we have hundreds of billions of dollars invested, is we will have been doing the same thing consistently for many, many, many years. So I think there is an, elf, an effort that we need to make and, and government needs to consider is perfect going to get in the way of a really good outcome. So I think there is an element of needing to lead, needing to move forward, refined by all means, but decide on a model rather than programs, because programs actually won't get us to the goal that we're trying to achieve. The other thing that will have occurred for the private sector is we will have reliable and strong partners. We have money. That's pretty much it. Um, and I'm not trying to be flippant about it, but we don't build homes. We don't operate homes, we provide capital. So in doing so, we must have very strong, very robust utility scale operators that have been able to absorb this hundreds of billions of dollars that we've committed. Looking today at the landscape, it's very hard to see that this won't be the community sector that takes this sort of responsibility. They will probably be the glue through which the uh, public sector support is delivered and private capital is also contributed. And through that mix, we have an advantage of not only do they not leak because of their trustee, they actually retain any surplus that they create, but they also have an experience of dealing with vulnerable people who is our target market and the purpose for which we're actually here is to consider those people and what we can deliver them in terms of safety and security. So we would encourage your policy development. If you want to look forward and look for 100 billions of dollars, you're going to need to have operators who are capable of handling that sort of capacity, lean in, support them, and give them strength. We've also talked about this a lot, but this becomes rather important in the institutional world. Scale is important. If you don't shoot for 100 billion, you're not going to get 20 billion, and that is not flippant sort of remarks when you're talking about a $3.5 trillion superannuation system, ignoring the insurance sector and everything else that goes on and ignoring a global capital market with institutional capital. If you aren't talking those sorts of numbers, it doesn't matter. It's sort of rounding error. Now, the one thing you've got to be conscious of when dealing with institutional investors, they don't have to invest in anything. They choose to invest in something. To choose to invest in something, you must have an understanding of it. You must have the capacity to be able to access it. It must be of scale, history, repeatability, all those sorts of things that form the basis of a capital market. We will need a capital market if we've invested hundreds of billions of dollars. And going to that last point, they're the sort of the main features that we think are, you know, what's important to actually attract that sort of capital, but to then to consider, okay, is the appetite today? There are a lot of people and a lot of individuals within organisations right throughout the private sector, be it in institutions or be it in intermediaries and asset managers like ourselves, who are very interested in this sector. We want to make a contribution. But if we step back at an institutional level, we typically define appetite in terms of dollars that are allocated within a strategic asset allocation. Today, it's nascent. It has promise, but it does not exist. We need to be conscious of that. We are asking institutional investors whose purpose it is to deliver a retirement savings outcome to do something new. To do that, we will have to give them confidence. We'll have to give them something to attract them. We have goodwill at the moment 
but we have to make sure that we deliver an outcome because the opportunity is now and maybe it's tonight. We'll find out at about 7.30. Um, but I think the framework that you put together, Richard and team, is fantastic. I think the excitement that's been generated around the new government and the work that you guys have been doing over many, many years, uh, it certainly augurs well for the future. But thanks for the opportunity to, to give my thoughts as well. To you, Tom. Thanks, Peter. Look, thank you all. And to look, now is the chance, I guess, to bring in some thoughts and ideas uh, from uh, people uh, participating in the webinar, and I'll put those uh, to you uh, now. We've had some really good uh, questions come through. Um, and I think just reflecting on that in terms of the, the question I answered earlier about the, the range of, of what we mean by affordable housing in this conversation, there's also obviously a big breadth of what we mean by um, private sector as well. And of course, and we, we we just heard from Peter there, who's obviously talking about um, talking about finance and uh, but also or I guess particularly the equity um, coming in, the, the capital coming in uh, to to the system. Uh, but but um, but Richard, your um, your report obviously looks across the range of things. I, uh, so I just I want us to bear that in mind as we address I guess the first uh, tranche of questions. There was a bit of a cheeky question uh, put in there around you know given. Given that what we're addressing here is is a is a market failure, um, you know what is the you know, why why are we looking uh, to the market to actually um, be solving um, some of these problems? And I, I want to put that together with um, perhaps another question that came in, which was around, and you raised obviously the question of, of regulation um, as well, Richard. Uh, yeah, what what are some appropriate um, regulations, and and what are some of those? I guess. We want to call that um, you know, safeguards or, or things that we need to get in place um, either before or indeed as uh, we unleash um, private capital and uh, investment. I think perhaps the um, policy context around looking to the, the market for solutions is couched in neoliberalism policy, and that's been in Western countries for decades. Uh, you can argue that. The, the the validity or the the moral um credibility of that but um i suppose the opportunity sits with the challenge on the scale of the challenge and the numbers speak for themselves a hurry led research over the last few years has shown the scale of the demand you know we need 727,300 new social and affordable homes just to 2036. yes government has to be an important part of that um, but to get to that level of homes, every sector has a role to play. And I think Amy made this comment as well. The pie is big enough where everybody actually has to get in there to be able to bake this pie and to complete this pie. That's not to say that there are not uh, potential unintended consequences from the private sector getting involved. And when we look at countries where the private sector has been more um, rigorously involved, um, such as the United States and um, in Germany, in the aftermath of the GFC, we saw the financialization of social housing, where private equity came in, bought up social housing that was sold by government, and um, without proper regulation, ended up um, not maintaining it properly in some cases, so that the quality of that housing went down very low, or sort of holding it in steady state until they could uh, flip it and raise the rent. So that begs the question, what? regulations and, and controls need to be in place to prevent that. And I think we're, um, we have an advantage in that sense in Australia in the sense that we have uh, the National Community Housing Regulatory System. And it regulates housing providers, private, not-for-profit housing providers. It regulates their governance, their finance, their management, um, and ensures, as Peter mentioned, they don't leak, that their um, operations, that their finances are reinvested into housing outcomes but also that they provide quality outcomes, both in terms of the built environment, but also in terms of tenant outcomes. So we heard from panelists, policy panelists, as well as industry panelists, that that framework exists, why reinvent the wheel? Potentially there's opportunities for that providing some regulatory controls around um, the, the, um, the private sector is partnering with the not profit sector in delivering social and affordable housing. What? bring you in on that question as well, Amy. Do you have further thoughts on that? Yeah, and I take the point in terms of, you know, the market has kind of contributed to where we're at, why are we looking to them to solve it? But I think 
what's different now is we are looking at a, a system with much better structure. If we've got the things that Richard and the team are advocating for, we've got a strategy. Hopefully we've got um, funding that's really supply focused. We've got coordination between levels of government and we've got incentives in the right places that aren't working against each other to undermine the good consequences of the system. So I think if we've got that structural change and we've got all of that you know, system clarity, which we haven't had the, the benefit of having to this point, that hopefully the outcomes um, can be much better and help to direct that funding where it's needed rather than kind of being a bit more ad hoc like it's been to this point. Yeah. And Peter, I might ask you, I guess, what, one of the more specific questions that's come through from uh, Julie Lawson, making, I guess, a distinction between, um, you know, equity or, you know, the capital and, um, and, and debt uh, finance um, in, in development. And um, also looking at, I guess, outcomes and, and what, you know, you want to achieve, um, not just in sheer numbers of houses, but, you know, the outcomes that that helps us deliver. Um, question is, will the for-profit private equity sector um, take responsibility for seeing the actual um, outcomes that we want um, being achieved? Wow, broad, um, Tom, and uh, big shoulders. Uh, how to take that one. Look, I, I think I'm going to try and blend that with the question that was asked before, yeah. which yeah, was please. around why are we asking the private sector into this equation in the first place? And I think it's a really, really good question, is what does the private sector and what is their capability to deliver that is not currently available within the system? If it's just capital, then you'll get a particular outcome. If it's efficiency you're looking for, or if it's the capacity to take risk and absorb risk, you will get a different outcome. I think that's the one thing that the private sector has shown that they can possibly do between sort of economic cycles and between political cycles is they can absorb a lot more risk sometimes than public sector balance sheets actually can. And certainly when I look at our prospective partners for the private sector and looking at the community sector, looking at a community housing provider like they're an insurance company and they make it soak up a whole lot of risk is not going to be a path that's going to get us very far. A reminder that the private sector and what they do within the institutional asset allocations is they actually look for risk that they can purchase and use it differently in their portfolio. It doesn't mean they buy risk blindly, but they are looking for it. How would you align the private sector? Uh, I have a particular view on this, but it comes down to ultimately public policy. Unregulated, unchecked, it's not particularly healthy. There's so much evidence of that. I don't need to point out the bleeding obvious. Um, we think a more sustainable model at the end of the day is service delivery uh, is probably best delivered by the community housing sector, not just based on their uh, capability and their experience, but if you actually look to the heart of their trustees, their constitutions and their purpose, that's what they're there to fulfil. The question that has to be asked then in that service delivery from the community sector, what can the private sector absorb in terms of risk that cause challenges in that service delivery? Now, maybe it is cash flow cyclicality. Maybe it's what we're dealing with today, which is I know that would be fair to say uh, a dozen or two dozen community housing providers that had projects on their books and they had their Excel models out and they had a mythic funding piece and they were putting that in and they were popping in an interest rate like 2.0%. And it was producing an outcome that says, computer says yes. Now today, that input is a completely different number and that stops everything in its tracks. The private sector actually can absorb those sorts of, institutional investors can absorb those sorts of risks and be able to manage them to the point at which you actually do get continuity of service delivery and not necessarily jamming those risks down onto the relatively small balance sheets of the community sector. But to go to the specifics of the question, you've got to be really particular about asking the private sector what risks you want them to manage, what risks you want them to take and what role you want them to play because you'll get very different outcomes depending on how you answer that question. Thanks, Peter. Richard, coming back to you, um, you obviously in your talk you outlined a range of barriers there that, that um, maybe 
can uh, you know become and a range of uh, potential solutions and opportunities for private sector involvement. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, uh, prioritisation of some of those things? Are there certain, you know, are there low hanging fruits that can, that could or should be addressed straight away, or um, are there certain things that need to be done, you know, in some sort of priority order? You know, what can you sort of, you know, take that range of things you've discussed and and give it some ordering around uh, you know, priority and you know, what what should you know, do some things necessarily precede other things? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the number one priority to make sense of any direction going forward is having a national housing strategy that understands the types of housing that we need across market segments, how much we need and where we need it. And we know what policies and subsidies work to support those different housing product types. So we can quantifiably um, estimate what sort of government um, commitments are needed in line with those targets. That provides the funding that's necessary to be able to um, engage the private sector in meeting the scale of the demand, but it also provides the certainty that is the number one barrier that we heard about, both from developers and from um, institutional investments and institutional um, investors and um, banks. The number one hurdle for them to engage in this is um, longevity of policy decisions, policy pro, um, policies and, and funding funding streams. And you need a housing strategy to be able to focus what the right policy is and how much of that funding is needed and where it's needed. So this is a academic exercise. It's done with asset strategies for other types of assets. You know, it's done all the time for, for roads and for rail. So I think the opportunity is to apply those same methods that we use and that the government's very familiar with, with hard infrastructure and bring it into considering uh, social housing as um, social infrastructure so that we're making the right decisions um, and investing in the right types of policies and subsidies to engage the private sector. I mean, Peter, do you have um, a position on you know, what, what things should be prioritized in terms of, uh, in terms of engaging the private sector more effectively uh, within vision of uh, social and affordable housing? Um, okay, I agree wholeheartedly, Richard. Um, might be a little bit biased given where I sit in terms of strategy, but I think that's such an important um, piece of the puzzle that brings all the partners together and understands what we're all working towards. And I think without that, it is very hard to get, um, you know, that foresight and that future commitment to where we're all going. And the funding doesn't follow unless you've got that really set, strong sense of where you're going. So, and I think it's equally as true for CHPs as it is for other partners in the private sector. Without that longevity of vision, we don't have the resources to just go into repeated cycles of scaling up and investing time and resources in learning new models. And, you know, we're just like the other private sector partners where that longevity gives you the license to invest the time, invest the relationships, really explore what the other partners in this equation are going to need to kind of bring it to life. So definitely for us, that kind of really clear strategy and a future focus that everyone can kind of get behind is absolutely essential. And then the rest of it sort of hangs in the structure around that. Peter? Yeah, what they said, absolutely. <laughs> but, um, just to give it a slightly different twist, um, this is a nascent, and I said that before, this is a yep. nascent asset class for institutional investors. Um, I'm going to show my age here, but I recommend those in policy environments start contemplating the experiences that this country has had in creating new asset classes. And the most obvious one, which most superannuation funds have enjoyed enormously, is the creation of the infrastructure asset class. And that came from, in the 1990s, an asset allocation of less than half a percent for most of the investors there. Uh, it is built steadily over time because we have delivered opportunity. But I can one thing I can say sort of you know, quite clearly, the experience, the early experience of investors that got into that sector was positive. And others wanted to follow because it was a positive experience they wanted to build on their positions because it was a good experience. 
So it's again very going to be very very clear about what you're asking the private sector to do. If you're asking for cheap money with low returns and those sorts of things, there might be stimulation associated with that. But it's very very hard to try and get lots of other investors to follow another investor who's actually making a lower return. So we need to be conscious that at the end of the day, the institutions of which we're engaging with have a specific purpose. And that is to deliver a return objective to those that they are accountable for. And in many cases, it's actually all of us and our retirement savings. We're not asking them to donate their money. We're asking them to choose between the best possible investments to get the best possible returns. If we want a capital market, what do we need to do first? We actually need to get investors who have good outcomes, and people need to even acknowledge that. That you know, maybe we're not going to try and squeeze the last piece of you know value out of that first deal because we're trying to encourage others to do the same thing again. So be conscious that institutional investors have a choice. We're one of the unique sort of pieces of this puzzle puzzle in that we don't actually have to choose to invest in this sort of at all. So let's make sure that the experience is a positive one. Let's not, and, that, and that's if we want the private sector, right? So you've got to consciously acknowledge that question at the outset. But if the first step needs to be a positive one, or there won't be a second, third, fourth, and fifth step. Yeah. Um, can I broaden the conversation, I guess, looking at those sort of international um, comparisons and examples that um, you investigated as part of your um, sort of background uh, literature search, uh, Richard, and uh, and I guess ask you and, and indeed the others um, where where you think uh, the, the private sector in you know in engagement at scale uh, has has been happening and happening effectively, happening well, and um, and what are some of the I guess principal ingredients uh, for the success of that. Based, go, Richard, first based on, on uh, the research thing. Thank you. Let me pick a couple of examples, I suppose. Um, um, I'll go to the UK um, first. So in the United Kingdom, they've used their planning system to have inclusionary requirements for affordable housing on private sites quite, quite widely. And it has factored into a large supply of um, homes. Parallel to that, they have a very strong community housing organization, which has benefited from long-term subsidies and very strong balance sheets. And what we heard um, in, um, from participants in Australia is um, they're looking for that same sort of level of scale um, to support the, the level of private sector investment. Encouragingly, they're also quite open to mandatory inclusionary zoning because if it's provided on a consistent basis with a level playing field, then it can be factored into project costs and, and, and project feasibility. Um, turning to the United States, we um, have the low income housing tax credit scheme, this tax subsidy that was created in the 80s by a Reagan conservative government, but has had strong bipartisan support ever since then. It has delivered over a million new homes to date. And in 2021 alone, there were 100,000 new homes that were financed through this tax subsidy that very much looks like the NRAS tax subsidy, except that it's for a longer duration of time. And it's been around for 30, 40 years. And so to Peter's point, there's a very high level of comfort from private um, investors and developers to factor that into their, their, their financing stack. Um, and to know that it's going to provide that gap subsidy for them to be able to deliver housing where it's needed relative to the housing market and the household income. It's administered very efficiently with the funding being given to the states and then states set the targets in terms of um, how many homes they need tied to their housing strategy in which locations. Um, so we don't, I suppose, have to um, necessarily reinvent the wheel when we see schemes like that that have operated for decades and um, have had a high level of, of success in terms of delivering new social and affordable housing um, with um, cross-sector partnerships. Um, you all uh, very enthusiastically uh, said that having that national strategy and a, a sort of, I guess, um, an agreement between Commonwealth and states was really fundamental to, to making this work. And 
I think uh, I want to tie that to a really interesting question from you from, from Nicola Foxworthy around, um, is the issue really just about being a bit a, a lot clearer about the kind of um, outcomes that we actually want? And, uh, and, and just you know, that being, I guess, the basis then on which we engage you know, with the private sector or you know, whomever then uh, to actually look at how we go about, you know, in, in a sense, is the, is the actual mechanism itself you know, secondary to that, um, that understanding, that, that articulation of, of what we're trying to achieve here? What do you think? Um, I, I think it's a good point, but it also shows a very slight deficiency, I think, in the panel, and that was we really should have a private sector developer here too as well, being able to talk about this, because I think the point Richard was making around mm. uh, just those two, the two combination of models there, uh, I think are vital for integration within the Australian marketplace. And there's not an area I, I particularly understand other than I live in a city. Um, and that is, you come down to inclusionary zoning. If we don't actually, you know, tackle that problem now, it's very hard to retrofit these challenges when you've built schools, hospitals, key service areas, and you've got no more affordable products in that region. You've let it all get developed and it's all gone different ways. You've got to wait for 40, 50, 60 years until the business, that building is no longer functional and you, that's the only time you get to replace the outcome. So looking at that objective, what are we trying to achieve? actually trying to provide housing to the whole community so let's start with that one inclusionary zoning i think is going to be vital but what we need to be able to say to the private development sector is how are we as a community going to care for them while they're delivering that product how will we respond when they are given a 30 percent mandatory target from a build to sell product that then needs to be rented for the next 10 20 30 years on an affordable rent so this is where we think the you know the housing providers combined with available capital from uh, the private sector can actually step into that breach and into that that pocket to be able to provide them capital within part of their development framework so as they can achieve the outcome that they need which is a development profit take that risk but we get the inclusion of zoning outcome you integrate that with exactly what Richard was referring to before, and that's including the best outcomes from, say, the US system, which is incredibly simplistic, but so effective. And that's probably why it's effective, is because it's so simplistic. So if we put those two combinations together, that way we can deliver the product that we're looking for in the first place, which is housing for all people within that community. So looking at those objectives, I think you make, you've got to make sure that you're actually designing the system to fit that outcome. And you certainly don't design it to fit the private financier outcome. You start with what's the product I want for the community and then how can each party contribute to that and solve that problem. What about the community itself? And maybe Amy, I'll turn to you. Like to, to what extent um, is it, um, do we need to be actually bringing in, um, I guess the voices and the, the views of actual consumers here, uh, the people who will um, occupy these homes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and I think that's another reason why community housing providers are so well placed to be central in the delivery here, because we are so connected to the communities that we work in. That is a huge difference um, of our model. That is, you know, the reason that we uh, exist is to provide the houses that people need where they need them and in the typologies that they need them. So, I mean, we can absolutely do better at that. We definitely haven't got a, um, a perfect solution to how we engage and, and get that data that we can use for future developments. But it is something that I think would be at the core of each community housing provider is making sure that they are doing everything they can. While we've got this sort of absence of the structural systems to support that, and I go back to the data that, you know, links to the strategy, we definitely need that better data to help community housing providers at that, you know, more macro level. But every day community housing providers are doing work on the ground in their communities and understanding what the needs are. The difficulty is then housing's the lag product. So by the time we can actually respond to that need, there's obviously so many complexities within that system. So it is hard to structure that really well um, and get something that's, you know, can be delivered straight away in response to that need. And that's why these kind of discussions are so important, because if we've got the frameworks and we've got the funding that's available and it's more flexible and it's more available, 
then communities and community housing providers will be able to design local solutions that really meet the needs of what their communities are experiencing. And the system just doesn't have that capacity for response at the moment. So mm. these kind of conversations are hopefully going to move us into the direction where the community housing providers will be able to really respond to what their communities are needing much more readily than they can at the moment. Can I also just add, though, in terms of the um, inclusion rezoning point, this is something obviously that the sector's been advocating for for a long time and it was great to see in the report that there is an emerging level of support for that from the development community. And I think, you know, having worked in London with the Section 106 agreements and that kind of thing, they are just very powerful, of course. People accept that that's what they've got to do in order to develop in the locations that they want to develop or to access land or access government support. And I'm sure that they went through a huge process of getting that level of acceptance too, but they didn't get there by not doing it. And I think we've just got to kind of get around the table together um, and have that really open conversation. I, I absolutely agree. It's got to be everything on the table. It's got to be transparent. It's got to be predictable. It is very complex, of course. It's not simple, but we've just got to get it done. It's just such a you know really obvious part of the solution that has to happen. We've got to make sure that we can deliver this housing where it's needed and inclusion rezoning is a really critical part of that, designed well and with everyone at the table. Thanks, Abby. Um, before I am um, sort of getting you know, into the last uh, 15 minutes of, of the webinar, and I, I'm keen that we turn our attention at some point, I guess, to signals that are coming from the, the federal government uh, over the last day um, as well, and looking forward to um, you know, future announcements fairly soon around that. So come back to that in just a tick. But uh, there were a couple of questions, I, I guess, around um, what in Australia we would term like a capital city versus a regional um, divide. And, uh, you know, and, and so, Richard, one one question was, I guess, asking um, a little bit about the, I guess, the geographical spread of, of participants in your um, uh, panel discussions that informed um, this report, and and then flowing on from that to, um, you know, whether there's um, you know, different solutions potentially required uh, for for the larger cities versus um, versus other places in Australia. So, Richard, off the bat. We had um, we were very fortunate to have um, representation from um, um, all the jurisdictions um, except for Northern Territory, I will say. And this was the um, mixed blessing of lockdown. So when we were doing all this consultation, the the world and, and the country went into lockdown. And so we did all of our panels um, through video conferencing, and 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 as it turned out, it it was actually advantageous because we did panels. A finance panel so we had people from around the country who were all in the private finance section se sector with um not-for-profit uh, private not-for-profit organizations that were, were involved in working with them and similarly developers and the feedback we got from them is that they learned a lot from each other and 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 realized that these themes are consistent um around the country in terms of the solutions uh there definitely are it's horses for horses um, there's certainly a lot of market attention in the areas where the land value is highest. And we heard that those are the areas where you could potentially be getting the most benefit from inclusionary zoning. And we even heard from developers that the horse is kind of bolted. You know, that if the inclusionary zoning system had been worked through 10 years ago in Sydney, even five years ago, you imagine the amount of affordable housing that that would have leveraged and it would have been in the tens of thousands of units. So it's geographic, I suppose, in that sense, whereas in other areas where the land value might not be as high, it moves, um, it, it emphasizes the importance of that gap subsidy. Because the gap subsidy enables supply no matter where, the gap just fluctuates to, to, to plug the, the, the gap between what um, a, a household income can afford to pay and then what it costs in the market to, to, to deliver that. So that provides the sort of flexibility to support a pipeline of projects. Um, Really, regardless of location around the country, and there, and and thus the the, the um, emphasis by panelists that that kind of commitment to um, long term government subsidy gap subsidy is really important to unlock um, uh, private sector being part of the solution um, across the country. Hmm. Peter, what about you? I mean, you know, regional housing markets are pretty pretty tough at the moment. Um, what what are your 
thoughts around private sector potential in um, you know really really tight markets and you know markets which are you know seeing increasing numbers of uh, people locked out from private rental and um, increasing numbers of homeless people actually but, yeah. where do you see a role for the private sector yeah. yeah tom you're straying into the practical and um, we deal with the financial but um, not that we're, we're lacking in sympathy, but what I can't talk about, and quite rightly, because I don't know, is what is the logical on the ground solution. And then looking to the private sector to deliver that is probably wildly inappropriate. So I would direct attention for the solution, the built form outcome solution, probably to the community sector for that and those who work within those regional areas. But to reflect on the US model, how they deal with this. They do do state-based allocations of tax credits every single year. So it can be very targeted. It is somewhat systematized and it actually has a per capita allocation to start with, but it also naturally dis you know advantages. It's a bit like the US Electoral College. It all gets really confusing and there's actuaries in the background that have worked it out. But they are actually, because of their 30, 40 years worth of history in dealing with this, they have been able to deliver solutions in terms of tax credits to specific regional areas which private capital will naturally follow. That's the one thing that actually the private sector does understand. You put a dollar worth of the subsidy in Bendigo, Wagga or uh, Barcaldon, hmm. we will follow it. That's what we will do. But we, what we do need is somebody's actually going to build the product on the ground. Um, because we don't do much else, right? That's, again, I, I'm feeling a bit of the shallowness of my comments because I'm coming from a financing background of not a built form, but um, I don't think specifically the finance sector actually has a practical solution to it. We'd be looking for public policy makers to direct that and certainly the community sector and possibly in partnership with private developers to deliver that product on the ground. Okay, thanks, Peter. Okay, well, in the last few minutes, um, I would like to give you, I guess, the opportunity to, um, I guess, give some reflections around um, announcements that have been made um, recently. And again, I'll start uh, with you, Richard. Um, uh, you know, we're hearing about um, looking at trying to achieve, you know, a million new homes. Uh, I'm not sure under what uh, time frame I wasn't able to uh, notice that uh, book that I had, but. Um, can you start to um, you know, give some thoughts, Richard, around um, how you, uh, yeah, I guess, see this research uh, informing and feeding into um, very live policy discussion at the moment? It's certainly timing of this couldn't have been better, I suppose. I felt like all my Christmases had, had come this morning <laughs> when I opened up the paper. But even last week, um, Treasurer Chalmers called for the private um, institutional investment sector to help boost funding um, with government into social and affordable housing um, and called to set up round tables where they were going to work through creative solutions that can deliver housing and also provide a return to investors. This is what we heard through the panels. I mean, we, 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 we heard from and spoke with institutional investment funds that are actually doing this. And so the timing couldn't be better. And those people are going to be around those tables um, with the likes of Peter and um, Banks um, and the developers who um, have been involved in some of these mixed tenure developments as well. So I think timing is advantageous in the sense that we have learnings um, and we have proven replicable models that can be used to scale up participation. So we know what the models are. If we do that strategy piece, and we know how much we need to build of what type of housing where we can put the two pieces of the puzzle together and it starts to show how each sector plays its part to delivering on that million dollar, uh, sorry, that the, the million home. Yeah, the million yeah. a lot of them, hopefully a lot of them will be affordable. We don't know how many of them are gonna be affordable yet, but hopefully a lot of those million homes will be um, social and affordable. And the other comment I'll just quickly make is um, uh, we also have the, the legislation push going through quite quickly for the Housing Australia Future Fund, but let's not forget, yeah. even before that was committed, in the last two years, the states have committed billions and billions of dollars themselves into their own projects, their own pipeline of projects. They've already started to work on these um, initiatives. So I think we're in an opportune time 
where all levels of government have committed to working together on addressing the housing and homelessness yeah. problem. And that's very exciting. Yeah. Peter, um, you may or may not be um, part of those conversations around those tables, but um, I, I, get, I, I want to ask you actually, um, if I may, what, what do you think are some of the policy risks there um, as those conversations take place and as uh, these, um, you know, these ideas are, I guess, taken from the, the idea phase um, forward, um, what, what should policymakers be, be um, aware of and keep an eye out for in those conversations? I would probably say go very, very cautiously on what is sometimes referred to as either public or social housing. Um, I'm not sure what role is understood that the private sector can play in that. I think the affordable sector is a lot easier for the private sector and the community sector and the public sector to cohabit. But when it comes to uh, social and public housing, uh, I'm not sure that we actually have a specific model but that people understand and we can copy to be able to deliver on that. So um, I think in that context, be careful around uh, going too hard on that one. That's in complete contrast to exactly what I've said on the other side, which is please go hard, go fast and go long. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think on the affordable side, I think there are frameworks that can be quickly adopted. and. I think the mistake is coming up with a brand new model, another one. Um, I, I reference, for example, um, the specialist disability accommodation sector that we invest in borrowed all of its regulatory framework essentially from the energy industry. When you come to the financing world, we actually understand all of those risks, where everything goes and everything slots in. That's easy, that's simple. If you can, from a policy perspective, don't feel like you have to invent the moon. You know, it's if there's something that we can borrow, copy, and it's been understood, road tested in many different environments, we can embrace it. And I'm not sure there's a social housing model at the moment that everybody has as a poster child and says this is the one that actually works and the private sector plays a fantastic role in that. I can see that it works in the affordable sector and I can see great roles that the private sector has played in the affordable sector be cautious around you know public and social housing very very vulnerable and sensitive people and big issues thanks Peter. i really appreciate that and i guess again it continues to highlight that need to um just clarify strategically um you know, what the game of all this is doesn't it and amy just um i guess to give you the last word um what uh how are you receiving um uh the, the, the news from from the treasurer and uh and i guess what what do you think some of that means for uh, your organisation and, and your sector? Yeah, well, obviously we welcome all of these conversations about housing solutions. Uh, we have been advocating for so long for governments and the community to get behind this as something that is an absolute priority. So we obviously really strongly welcome all of this focus. It's just a shame it's had to get to such a pointy end to make it happen. But... You know, like you said, um, you know, the governments and we've seen the Queensland government here double its housing investment fund last week. Absolutely fantastic. Other jurisdictions are really going out of their way to make sure that they've got something in place now to do something about this. Local councils are more and more coming through with housing strategies and their own housing, you know, targets and solutions for their local areas, which is absolutely terrific. So we really, really welcome that. Um, it's not going to change things overnight, but it is absolutely heading in the same direction. So all of these announcements are really exciting. As we said, obviously, the devil will be in the detail how many of those million homes are social and affordable, where they'll be, how they'll be supported, who will deliver them, lots and lots of questions, obviously, still to be answered. But at least we're having that conversation. At least that is something that government's committing to, which is such a win compared to kind of where we've come from. So... You know, and to echo um, Peter's comments, I guess, it's this fine line between innovation, um, where we're going to get lots and lots of different models that are never replicable and really expensive to get for people to get their heads around and won't get off the ground, or being too prescriptive. And so we've got to find that kind of sweet point in these kind of deals where there's enough flexibility for partnerships to be created that reflect the needs of those partners within some boundaries that mean we're not all reinventing the wheel every time we try and do this. Mm. So I agree with you, Peter, but I kind of 
you know, I think that flexibility is also going to be really important, particularly getting things over the line in regional areas, which is going to be incredibly important as these roll out as well. Hmm. Well, thanks, Amy, and, and thank you, Peter, for your thoughts as well. And Richard, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we do uh, really appreciate and I'd like to, on behalf of uh, all the participants in the webinar today, thank you um, all for your your time and for your thoughts and uh, insights on this topic. Um, so thanks. Um, look, we're going to close the webinar now and I um, want to thank everyone uh, for participating and joining us today and for putting your questions forward and, and the, the conversations in the chat. We really um, value your engagement. Um, also would like to um, remind you again that we'd appreciate your uh, feedback in the in the survey that uh, will be sent to you shortly. Um, I want to remind you too that the um, the webinar will the recording will be available um, on our website um, over the next day or so, and um, you're welcome to return to it and, uh, and let others know about it as well. Um, and of course, the uh, renting in Australia um, uh, uh, one day conference in Adelaide. Uh, remind you of that as well. So thank you once again and uh, until next time when you uh, join us I um, say goodbye and thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Well done Richard.